I don't have a definition for it, but you you'll know it when you see it. It's kind of it's kind of like a definition I heard one time of another issue, uh, trying to define a, a a negative topic, and they said, I don't know how to say it, but it's just something that when you see it, you know it's there. We'll see it. Given the need for him, we want him ready on the spur of the moment to uh, uh, be a part of any effort we make to be tried to win the ball games. And so uh, it would be when uh, uh, we all probably thought it was time for him to come in and play. I don't want to give you those circumstances because I don't like either one of the discussions. Stephen A., I know you love Jerry Jones. You sported the shirt, and in Jerry you trust. But please explain to me, why can't this man stop talking about Tony Romo? Uh, because he wants Tony Romo in the lineup, and he's willing to undermine Dak Prescott to do it. Um, I think it's very, very clear. The more he talks about it, Jerry Jones is a brilliant businessman. He's a hype machine personified. Clearly, he wants the headlines, and certainly alluding to Romo makes it even more, uh, you know, there's more additional headlines that ultimately uh, will come the Cowboys' way. But it's deeper than that to me when I listen to Jerry Jones. I see someone clamoring for Tony Romo. Now that Tony Romo clearly sees the future, and sees the future of the Dallas Cowboys recognizing that he's not going to be a part of it in all likelihood, not if he wants to be a starting quarterback, because Dak Prescott is the future. This is the end for Tony Romo in Dallas. Multiple back surgeries, collarbone issues, and beyond at age 36. This is it. Jerry Jones recognizes that the Dallas Cowboys have an opportunity to be Super Bowl champions, and he wants Tony Romo to be the guy who takes them there. So it's not like Dak's not the future. It's not like De De Jerry Jones doesn't believe in him. It's not like he's not going to look forward to Dak Prescott, you know, guiding the Dallas Cowboys uh, to prosperity in the years and years to come. But at this particular moment in time, he is clearly willing to undermine Dak Prescott uh, in order to facilitate the resurgence of Tony Romo. And I suspect that Jerry Jones is not even the only one within the organization who feels this way, thinks this way, and is hoping this will happen. I think there are others, possibly guys wearing the uniform that want the same thing. The Dallas Cowboys, as far as I'm concerned, no matter how together they seem, they are a divided bunch when it comes to the Romo Dak Prescott issue. And I think that Tony, uh, that uh, Jerry Jones is illuminating that every time he opens his mouth. Hey, Stephen A., let's just read between the lines here. When you say you think that's the case, is that because maybe a little birdie told you? Yes, sir. Okay, that's what I thought. Look, I, I, <laughs> as it, <laughs> you got to read between the lines of Stephen A. When he says, I think, and then he tells you that half the team wants something, that's because he talks to a lot of people. Look, I didn't say half the team, though. I didn't say, but some. Some, some, some. people on the team. Yeah. Um, look, I don't know that, that this is that specific to Tony Romo in terms of Jerry Jones popping off about it. You know, it, it, Jerry Jones likes to be called coach. He enjoys that. He likes everyone to know how much he knows about football. He loves the culture of it and he loves uh, being thought of that way. And it's like getting mad at Jerry Jones for saying something he shouldn't. And let me be clear, he should shut up about Tony Romo at this, at this point. I mean, enough. You're under, or, or better yet, keep talking because you're undermining your team's chances. And I'm a Giants fan, so keep talking. If I were a Cowboys fan, I would just say, please, Jerry Jones, please shut up. Please stop talking. But he can't help himself in asking him to do that because he likes the attention. Asking him to do that is like, is like asking a lion not to eat, you know, uh, or a crocodile not to eat a wildebeest. That's what the crocodile does. It's not like a moral issue. He doesn't really have a choice. He's hungry. He's going to eat that wildebeest. Or actually, in Jerry Jones' case, it's more like telling the wildebeest, hey, don't go to the edge of that river because there are crocodiles in it. Wildebeest can't help it. It's thirsty. It's got to go, even though it knows it might get eaten by a crocodile. And that's what Jerry Jones is, a thirsty wildebeest. Well, you could say he's thirsty, but the, but the reality is that it goes far deeper than that. And the reason why it goes far deeper than that is because you have a rookie. Now, granted, Dak Prescott has shown tremendous poise. He seems to be an old soul, mature beyond his years. And even though I can't stand the Dallas Cowboys because they have the worst fan base in American history, they're delusional and they're annoying and obnoxious and I can't stand them, it doesn't take away from the fact that Ezekiel Elliott and Dak Prescott have been incredibly impressive. I'm proud 
proud of these young brothers, and I wish them nothing but the best, so long as they don't win the Super Bowl because I can't stand their fan base, and I don't want to hear their mouth for the next year. But the flip side to all of that is if you're Dak Prescott, you're still a rookie. No matter what your performance belies, it's who you are. And to be so incredibly insensitive to this man with what he's doing and riding those coattails and being enthusiastic and supportive of him. And instead, what you do is you give lip service or you articulate the obvious while at the same time making sure that everybody knows what your true wish is. And that true wish is not Dak Prescott. It's incredibly insensitive. Um, I would dare say it's unprofessional, but I would also say it's emblematic of who the Dallas Cowboys are and have been since Jerry Jones arrived. Jimmy Johnson and Jerry Jones together won three championships in four years. We recognize that. Jerry Jones was on a mission to prove that he was worthy, that he deserved more credit than Jimmy Johnson, who clearly was disrespectful towards him, refused to give him. All right. And ever since then, getting Barry Switzer, ultimately getting that third Super Bowl title. But some would argue that was with decisions that Jerry and Jimmy made. Jerry has been on a mission to prove that he deserves credit for all of this. It is now 21 plus years and counting. He has failed to do it and he will fail again That's just exactly. because of stuff like this. Now, I don't know if he'll fail again this year. Maybe. I hope he so. Will. I really he hope, will. I not hope he fails. I hope you're right year. about he that. He will not win the Super Bowl this I year. I hope you're right. I don't think they will either, but they have a good a chance as any. Um, Hell with They're them. the odds-on no. favorite in the opinion of some. Entertain no. this thought for a second. I agree with that analysis. Which is that. Entertain this thought for a second. What if the fact is that there are coaches and players on the Dallas Cowboys who, when they watch game film, when they watch the coaches film, they see things that Dak isn't seeing. They believe that Romo would see them. And whether or not they're correct about it, they genuinely believe that even though it would be unpopular because the team is 11-2 and two with Dak Prescott, it would actually increase their chances of winning a Super Bowl if they put Romo in. If you, if you can entertain that thought, Stephen A. Smith, and you think that's possible, then that sheds a different kind of light on what Jerry Jones is doing. As wrong-headed as it might be, he's, if that's the case, then he's doing it because he actually believes it. Well, here's why I would disagree with you, because I sometimes joke and call you Spock Kellerman, because you're logic. You're logical. And that's, because you're logical, you look, at it, you look at it from that perspective. It's not that you're wrong. It's that you're incomplete. Because when we talk about sports, we don't just talk about numbers. We also talk about results. And when we talk about results, we talk about what assists towards those results. Sometimes it is numbers. But a lot more often than not, it's not just numbers. It's cohesion. It's chemistry, it's togetherness, it's a flair, it's a vibe, it's, it's, it's a swag, it's all of those things that come with it. Intangibles that contribute to elevating one's ability and the collective forces around them, galvanizing the troops, bringing them together and spearheading them to prosperity. These are the kind of things that happen in sports all the time. The owners tell us this, the executives tell us this, and certainly the coaches, the coaching staff, and the players tell us this. So to throw all of that out the window because you love Tony Romo so much and he looks a bit better than Dak Prescott, the rookie, may look. I understand that Max Kellerman saying that, but there is no excuse on earth for the Dallas Cowboys to be articulating that position well, in no, the no, throws well, hold on, hold on, of Dak hold on. performing the way he's performing. Hold on, because... I actually believe that Dak should be the quarterback because of everything you just said, because of all that kind of conventional sports and football wisdom, particularly yeah. in football. But there are those who would say who work in the industry, which is why I'm sure the team is divided about this, that you can't get too caught up in the results. You can't get too caught up in the correlation between one guy starting under center and wins if you believe that in spite of that correlation, in terms of the causal relationship of the quarterback to the success, it would be better to have another guy back there. Then it actually takes courage to suggest that. Now, my own analysis of the situation is don't mess with this if you're Dallas. But that not, might not be everybody's. All right, guys, we got to leave it there. The Cavs cruise to a 103-86 victory over the Grizzlies despite playing without Kyrie Irving. J.R. Smith and LeBron both put up 23 points apiece, and Kevin Love recorded his fifth straight game with at least 20 points. But don't expect the same team effort tonight when the Cleveland Cavs travel to Memphis for back-to-backs. Here's Ty Lue with an announcement.
No Kyrie, no LeBron, no Kevin traveling. Thank you. Have a nice night. Dave, you can shut your you can close your mouth. What you about? You said they're not traveling. Please. No, they're not playing. But they're traveling. They're not going. Not going. Why um I felt like it. <laughs> why not play Kyrie? I just you know, if it, if his body was hurting that much and you know his legs was you know bo- you know, legs were tired, I mean it just makes sense to give him a little extra rest. No back to back. Stephen A, you got a problem with this? Well, listen, uh, they're talking about they're not traveling to Memphis. Am I correct? Yep. I have a huge problem with it. I I despise it. I can't stand it. I've been on the record saying that. And this is not an indictment against LeBron James, who's never even missed 10 games in a season in his career. This is not an indictment against the exceptional young coach that Tyron Lue is or Kyrie Irving or anybody else. This is a principled position that I have maintained all of these years that I've been covering the NBA, which is 20 and counting. I have a problem with individuals who choose to cho- who choose road games to take off. If you are going to take off, why can't you take off of one of the 41 home games you have? Because the chances are that people who are coming to see you at some point in time or another, they're going to be there to see you. Not to mention the fact that, uh, again, not only are they going to see you, but at the same time, it's your home team. It's your home turf. It's your home fan base. So they truly are coming to to root for the team, even in the event that a LeBron, a Kyrie, etc., aren't playing. But when you go on the road, you're going once possibly twice a year. They're not going to get an opportunity to see you on the road. If you're the Memphis Grizzlies and you're selling tickets to your fan base, what you're telling your fan, your fan base is, is gravitating towards that particular game because they're anticipating seeing a LeBron. They're anticipating seeing a Kyrie Irving. And that's their only shot throughout the season to see you. And you don't show up for that game. I just think that's, I just, that's I, just, right. I, I'm, I'm, I think it's insane, and I think it's wrong. There may be nothing you can do about it, but I'll tell you an idea that I have, Max Kellerman. A, a matter of fact, go ahead, Max. I'll yeah. wait to tell you yeah, what my that's idea right. You know why they don't get to see Max. them? Because they don't have them on their team. I mean, you know, Kyrie and LeBron and Kevin Love don't play for Memphis. They play for Cleveland. And what you're talking about is having business interests of the league supersede the competitive interests of the team. Uh, listen... Think about every player in NBA history. What are they really playing for? Like, how do we remember them? Why does Magic Johnson win the Larry Bird argument right now? He's got five, Bird's got three. Who's championships? Who's the best active coach in basketball? Greg Popovich. What does he do? He Popoviches his players. He rests them. Are you suggesting that there shouldn't be any such thing as a DNPCD, did not play coach's decision? Because that's what Ty Lue is saying. He's saying, look, They ain't going to play. That's a coach's decision. And for someone else to sit there, you or anyone else, say, yeah, but the only reason you're not playing them is because of X, Y, and Z. They're your best players. Why wouldn't you? That's really not for someone else to decide. That's for the coach to decide who's doing his best to marshal his resources in such a way that he gives his team the best chance to win a championship. And that's what it's about. So who is this actually serving? The Cleveland Cavaliers fans who root for that team and want the team to win a championship. And, and you, you just said you don't know what you're going to do about it. You know what you can do about it. I don't think anything should be done about it, but I'm interested to hear your plan, Stephen A. Well, first of all, if a cockroach was looking for crumbs on the ground, you could explain it away and philosophize about it. That don't make Hungry. it just. That doesn't Hungry make cockroach. it so. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. When I'm talking about it, first of all, I said, of course you can get rest. I'm talking about not just the interest of the league from a business perspective, a decency towards the fan base. Again, they're not going to see you because they don't live there in Cleveland. If you're coming to Memphis once a year, you're coming to Utah or someplace like that, and that's the game you choose to sit out. I think it's incredibly insensitive to that fan base. And oh. I'm telling you what I I'm telling oh, you what I think. Where are the happen. violins? Where are the I'm violins? Sorry, Stephen I, I, A. I'm Smith. Sorry. Did I let you speak? You always you did always make fun of me you saying that did I'm I let in you my speak? emotions about this did, stuff. Did, did I let you speak? Did I let Sometimes. you speak? Let me get to my point. I specifically said I had a point, and it is this. I believe that the NBA should start allowing fans in the event that you choose not to 
show up and play, I think that the fans should be allowed to get their money back or get a discount. Because when they charge those ticket prices for that particular game, it was with the thought that LeBron and Kyrie would be in uniform. And if you're not going to show up, this is not Cleveland, mind you, because they're there 41 nights a year. This is on the road, the only time you would get to see them. That's cheating the fans. Well, I and mean, let me tell you something. the fans of Cleveland. What? I mean, listen, Memphis, get your game up. Like, you know, get players that people are interested in watching. So and that, I, I, need, I good, have a question. By the way. I have a question. I have a yeah. question because this is where I'm confused. Are you saying that LeBron and Kyrie and Tyron Lue should not care about anybody but the Cleveland fan base? Of course that's what I'm saying. Oh, no, 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 no. Now, now, now we're getting somewhere because we have, we are diametrically opposed to this. One of the things that I've said, and I've said this on many occasions, when you talk about MJ, when you talk about Kobe, they were headliners who accepted the responsibility of being headliners. This is the kind of situation that comes forth with this new collective bargaining negotiation that, they, that, that they're engaging in. This is the kind of stuff that turns the public against right. a player or a team. Yeah. Because what, yeah. ha hold on, what, ahead, what happens ahead, is, Max, is this. What happens is, Max, is this. We understand that you could get around anything. We respect that. And we know it's taxing on a body, et cetera, et cetera. But when you are insensitive to a road team where they're never going to see you, Memphis probably ain't going to the finals, that means you're not going to see LeBron at all if you're in Memphis. When you sit in, you have no regard for that. Why is that? It's because of the money. Because, see, when the salaries weren't what they were, and you had the sneaker company supplementing your income, and you were encouraged and provoked and incentivized to show up no matter what, you didn't hesitate to do it. Right. So but now, now we have gotten pretty, somewhere it's indeed. Like, oh, this way we now, are. Now we have gotten somewhere indeed. What you are suggesting is that these guys put on their business hats in the middle of a season and allow business interests to supersede competitive interests. And all those things you're talking about, yeah, maybe in a CBA, you try to incentivize players to play on the road against teams for some reason. They're only going to be there once or twice, whatever. I mean, I don't care that much about that. Go watch the guys on TV or go travel to the other city or go get better players. But, but okay, if, that's, if it is a legitimate business interest, you want the, the, the league engaged, the, the fans of the league engaged, sure. But in the middle of a season, to be angry at a coach or players for putting their competitive interests in terms of winning a championship that year ahead of their business interests. I have interests. a question. Why? I have, yes. I have a question. This is where I'm so confused. You keep saying their competitive interests. Right. I'm saying to you, Max, let me, let me, let me, let me see, let me try to, to crystallize where I'm going. You act like, I'm, you keep bringing up competitive interests. What I'm saying to you is suppose they had a game in Memphis tonight, but Cleveland tomorrow night. What I'm saying is what's wrong with playing on the road with people who will never otherwise see you and taking a night off in a city where they always see you? Let me ask you I, this. Uh, what's, what's wrong with let's that? Say I don't it, understand let's say, let's how say is some, that competitive interest? What are you talking about? Let's say somehow Memphis makes it to the finals. Everyone else gets hurt in the West, and, or they match up well with Golden State because they can post up whatever it is, <laughs> and Memphis makes it to the finals. Are those f fans in Memphis going to be cheering for, for Cleveland, or are they going to be cheering for Memphis? They're going to be They're cheering interested. for Memphis. Right. What's Those fans are interested in their about? team. So, so that is reciprocated, fans and team. The Cleveland Cavaliers players would like to hook their fans up, not the fans of another team. This is very straightforward. I'm saying to you, you hook them up 41 nights a year. As opposed to the one night a year, you never see them. You only see them once a year. That, I'm saying you, you, you don't have a so, – so, oh, so it's, oh, I got it. Okay. Well, we disagree. That's fine. Because I, I just wanted to be clear. You don't give a damn about any fan base outside of your own. That's essentially what you're saying. If you're playing yes. Cleveland, you shouldn't <laughs> care exactly about anybody else. That's what I'm saying. Inwardly okay, focused, I Max Kellerman. And, 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 and last, time I checked, last time I checked, the money that the players are being paid is because of the money they generate, not just locally, that, but nationally. Right. And right, oh, by the way, that ain't, hold on, hold on, that hold on, ain't Ty Lue's problem. Hold on, that ain't Ty Lue's problem. Ahead, what, Max, well, what Max is saying, 
then there's no sense in NBA players ever playing an Olympic competition. Why represent your country? Who cares? Yeah. All you yes. need to care about is your That's city. That's right. They, the only okay. time the NBA players should play in the Olympics is when Team America is getting whooped and we need to really let the world know who runs basketball. That's when they should play. Otherwise, we should never send our guys to play. Okay, well, I gentlemen. exactly appreciate it. Let's, I understand. Let, let's, You're wrong, let's but Let's agree I to disagree. And despite the travel day, uh, lack of travel day, no player in NBA history has played more minutes than LeBron prior to his 32nd birthday, which is about two weeks away.